Mr. Dragon Slayer here, and I've come with a short message and a teaching. First off, I'd like to say that this is an intellectual work, which I claim the intellectual rights to. I ask that any and all please respect this so as not to infringe upon my rights and steal my ideas, and or use any part whatsoever of this work without my express written consent. Here goes. Matthew 16, 1. Matthew 16, verse 1. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired that he would show them a sign from heaven. That all the other signs that Jesus displayed weren't good enough by far for the Pharisees and Sadducees. That they had united together even though they didn't agree upon principles with one another, that one believed in the resurrection and one of them didn't. So, kind of a strange unification. But in their mind, for a bad cause. <laughs> so they want a sign. Yeah, we know that they strain at the gnat and swallow the camel, though. We know that they lay heavy burdens on men's shoulders and won't lift a finger. That they're like whitewashed sepulchre cures and they're full of dead men's bones. So we get an idea and their pride and arrogance that they want the chief seats in the synagogues and want to be greeted and spoken well of in business. And the list just goes on. Okay, verse 2. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. You know, not much has changed. People can can flip on the, the news in their local town and see the 10-day forecast and a lot of it and see when the rain's coming and look at the radar and listen to the meteorologist, you know, that they can do that today. But what's the real problem? We're going to find out verse 3. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but ye cannot discern the signs of the times. Yeah, that they don't discern the signs of the times for sure. That what is the sign of the time? The kingdom of God is come, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. And yet their hearts are so hardened and they're so dumbed down that they don't recognize it. Yet they can see see the display of the, the signs in the sky for the weather, yet they can't even see the weather of the day, so to speak. Verse 4, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah's. Jonah, and he left them and departed. Oh, what a rebuke. Let's go back to those notes, though. Here we go. Here we go. This isn't my stuff, but I think it's valid. I'll go ahead and read this. The Pharisees and Sadducees were opposed to each other in principles and in conduct, yet they joined together against Christ. But they desired a sign for their own choosing. They despised those signs which relieved the necessity of the sick and sorrowful and called for something else which would gratify the curiosity of the proud. It is great hypocrisy when we slight the signs of God's ordaining to seek signs of our own devising. Isn't that the truth? All right, so here's another uh, off somebody else's commentary. I think this is Matthew Henry. For, uh, not verse 1, just number 1. Jonah was thrown into the sea by the mariners to whom he had entrusted himself. Christ was delivered to death by the Jews to whom he was specially promised. Okay, the second one, second key. Jonah was willingly thrown into the sea. Christ willingly laid down his life and man took it not from him. Okay, the third key. Jonah, by being cast into the sea, saved those in the ship. Christ by his death saved the children of men. 
The fourth key, Jonah, after he had been in the whale's belly three days, was cast upon the dry land. Christ, after three days, rose again from the dead. And the fifth key, finally. The Nivenites, though, uh, threw upon the preaching of Jonah, they made a show of repentance, yet returning to their former sins were soon after destroyed. So were the Jews within 40 years after Christ's ascension. Interesting, huh? All right, let's get back at it. Here we go, verse 5. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Eh, boy, they're sure forgetful. But see, they're not being led by their belly either, like some. Verse 6, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Yeah, that they were the sons of the devil. Verse 7, And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. That sometimes these disciples are pretty dense, that if they don't see through the spiritual lens, but rather through their carnal lens, their fleshly lens. Verse 8, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because you have brought no bread. Yeah, that what is the bread for the Pharisees? Man, their money talks probably, their tithe talks, devouring widows' households. Not giving a darn about orphans, um, straining at the gnat and swallowing the camel, laying heavy burdens on men's shoulders. Yeah, and etc. etc. Okay, verse nine. Do you not understand yet? Do you not yet understand? Neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets you took up. Yeah, that you got to remember that they went and gathered all those baskets from a previous miracle. Okay, verse 10. Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many baskets you took up. That They should have that in remembrance, call that into remembrance in their processing. Like, hey, look, we can, we can pray for bread and the Father will give it unto us. That we can multiply these loaves and, and this flesh. Okay, verse 11. How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to your concerning bread, that ye should be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Yeah, that you know a little bit of leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Yeah, it'll cause it to rise. That Man, it's going to make it of none effect. Their traditions of men, that they're going to, amplify the traditions of men in many cases so that it it makes void the word of god and that's what they're guilty of verse 13 when jesus came into the coast of the uh, caesarea philippi he asked his disciples saying whom do men say that i the son of man am that this is a question that he knows the answer to, but it's one of those those questions he wants to see the free will exhib exhibited of the disciples. Okay, so 14. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, Elijah, and some others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. 15. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And I'm pretty sure they got a good idea. I mean, when was the last time you saw somebody walking in such great faith where they were multiplying loaves of bread, loaves and fishes? Now, when was the last time you saw that? That's right. You didn't? That I never saw it. Verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yeah, that Peter has some kind of backbone. And he realizes 
But how does he realize? He realizes by the oida, by the anointing within him, by the Father. Okay, verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Is that the only time the Father speaks? And he just doesn't speak to humanity anymore? People that seek his counsel? Well, for some, yeah, that don't have faith, of course. Of course he doesn't. Oh, ye of little faith. that No, he's not going to if you don't have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Okay. Verse 18. And I say unto thee, Thou... Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Yeah, that Peter, the rock, I think built, they built the church upon that. Upon what? Upon that confession. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yeah, that that's the foundation. Jesus Christ, and that we build upon it, and that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Okay, here's something pretty interesting, though. Verse 19, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Yeah, that what you allow, whose sins you retain are retained, whose sins you loose are loosed. So, is that a little bit much for Peter? Without the Holy Spirit, I should say so. And the rest, that that's a lot of power. But we got to remember that God is in control. God is in control. So, what else can we learn from this? Well, if we're disciples of God, we should be able to loose things on the earth and, and bind things up in the earth and they should be bound in heaven they should be loose loosed in heaven that we should walk in the same kind of power that was that just for peter was he the only one to have the keys to the kingdom are you kidding me do you really believe that because i don't for a minute believe that i believe that we can have keys keys on earth to open up doors that no man could shut and close doors that no man can open. Yeah, that it would take God to do so. Okay. Like we've got to fight through. Satan tries to always masquerade as, as an angel of light. So of course Satan's going to try to be a doorkeeper. And they're going to try to lock, lock doors and stand in the way of doors. And keep you out from their blessing and. And the list just goes on, but there's more that I want to talk about with this stuff that it's really on my heart recently that I've been talking a lot about Solomon and some of the grief that I've been caused by this stuff that I want to talk a little bit about it. So we're going to go back to the notes. We're going to talk a little bit about Solomon now, talking about binding things up and loosening things that I want to be on the same page. I, f I still feel like that that we're not on the same page. Not even close. That I want to talk about what I think about Solomon. And what I think about David. That yeah, I'm sure they're in heaven and that they've been forgiven or whatever. But I want to talk about some things that you may not be aware of. Like we know that Solomon killed, murdered, you're uh that he murdered his brother Adonijah. Well, why did he? Because of Abishag. That's why. Because he asked for her hand. But we remember that that God didn't want a king. That he wanted to be king. So that he remember in the warnings of the things that they the kings would practice. It could really tell that it was going to be the traditions of men and not the traditions of God. That's for sure. But this is the thing that really gets me upset about the whole deal. Let's go right here. The Greek historian Herodotus records that this fact in saying that among 
the Persians, a new king inherited the previous king's harem, and that to possess a king's wife was as good as having the title to the throne in Israel. This had, in fact, been one of Adonijah's older brother Absalom's tactics when he attempted to take the throne of David. Yeah, that he went and put him up on top of that building. So Adonijah knew that since the young woman Abishag was part of David's harem, if he were to marry her, it would strengthen his claim to the throne considerably. Now, is that why he wanted her, the virgin Abishag? That he would ask for it? Well, it does seem like a big slight and a big deal, but there's more to the story. The rest of the story is, is that Solomon had so many wives, it's not funny. And that he wasn't willing because of the traditions of the kings of Persia to give his brother. That since when does Israel practice other nations' kings' traditions? Oh, that's right. They're not supposed to. They're supposed to be operating in the tradition of God. Yeah, they're not supposed to do that. Okay. So let's go ahead and just go to 1 Kings 11, 1 through 8. Verse 1. And he, that's... Solomon had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. What's this? The guy that goes and writes all these Proverbs slays Joab and slays Adonijah for wanting one woman has over 700 wives. Okay? 700. You think he can manage that? Because guess what? I don't. I don't think he can manage it. I think he's full of pride and arrogance. Verse 2. And of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. Yeah, that you're not to go have sex with them if you're a male. Or your daughters aren't to have set, let them come into them if they're a female. For surely they will turn away, what? Your heart from God, of course, after their gods. And Solomon clave unto these in love. Oh, we call that love? No, I call it lust. That what a hypocrite. He kills his own brother, murders him. And then he takes it to greater heights than I could even imagine after I had a whole kingdom, after I had... Just everything handed to me just to turn your back on God and just spit on him. That's what it's like in my sight just to do that. While I see my brothers and sisters suffering and people praising Solomon as if he was God. It's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. That look at this guy. Look how he was. Just because you start out good does not mean you finish good. I just want to reiterate that. Because you started out good does not mean you end well. Verse 3. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Well, I thought that was verse 1, but evidently I've done wrong. Okay, verse 4. For it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was his heart of David his father. Yeah, that we see that David his father, that what what is the relationship between Bathsheba and David, his father? Now, how did he come to her? Oh, by, by covetousness, by adultery, by lust, and by murder, that Uriah. And then just trying to cover it over and pretend like he's the good guy. Oh, I'm the good guy. I'm taking my poor friggin' warrior's wife, uh, Uriah. Oh, look how good I am. Yeah, that, that's what I think it's like. I do think it's like, like that. And so who is Solomon? He's the offspring of these two. In my life, man, you, you go do that in today's days in Christendom. I don't think so. You're not going to get away with that. Not in a million billion years. That I bind that stuff up. If you think you're going to get away with that, you better forget about it. And if you agree with stuff like that, man, you're an abomination too. 
You are an abomination in my sight. If you sit there and defend that, then who are you? What kind of perversion? What kind of varying scales? What, what a great respecter of men. You know, something else that grieves me is that Solomon has a lot about the poor. That boy, he sure liked to beat up on the poor, huh, and tax them. But he liked to say that poor people were practically worthless. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a friend of his. I'm what you would call an adversary. I don't like it. I don't like poor people being discriminated against, being disrespected, being cast down by some rich fool. Yeah, that's right. I said fool. Okay, verse 5. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Mal Ammonites. Excuse me. Ammonites. Oh, so he's able to go after him, and everyone's going to sit there, and he's the greatest king, the most wise. Yeah, seems pretty unwise to me. Very unwise to turn his back on God, huh? And just practically just bury his head in the sand, huh? Pretend like he doesn't know or see or hear or anything anymore. Oh, well, we all fall short. <sighs> I don't call that falling short. I call it an abominable axe. Yeah, God's first place, huh? Sure. Now, who are you agreeing with? That's what I want to know. Who are you in agreement with? Okay, that I'm not a Jew, okay? First of all, I'm not a Jew. That I'm Caucasian. That I am not a Jewish person. I want to keep it separate. Hey, I'm not them. I'm Christian. I'm part of the body of Christ. Remember, there's no Greek. There's no Jew. There's no Gentile. Yeah, that's why I don't want to hear about this stuff. I want to keep it separate. That the Jews can have their stuff. That Yeah. I'll keep my people separate from them. Here we go. Look at this. Verse 6. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did, his, as did David his father. Yep. Okay, verse 7. Then did Solomon build on high and high, high place for Chumash, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abomination of the children of Ammon. What a guy, man. Last time you went and built something, huh, for a foreign god? Yeah, go build something for Muhammad, huh? The prophet, yeah, for Islam. Yeah, sure I would. Yeah, never. How about that? Never. Never would I do such an abomination. I'm not saying that I'm Lily White, but I am saying that, yeah, God is first place. Verse 8, and likewise... Did he for all his strange wives? Oh, that he wants to kill Adonijah over Abishag, huh? You don't think that made God mad? You don't think God just looked at him and said, Man, I don't think I'd do that, Solomon. Why didn't you ask me? And Joab? The, oh, do you think he said that? Go ahead and kill Joab? You think that's what God said to do? Do you? Do you think that's what God said? And then this guy's going to go and do this stuff. That you... You're going to go ahead and whitewash Solomon? That Why don't you look at it in history? You know the Ganisco of it all? You know, maybe the Oida would rise up in you, the Holy Spirit, that he's disappointed. And people that whitewash that stuff. Maybe like, oh, the Sadducees might whitewash it? Oh, great King Solomon? And the Pharisees? Oh, you think they might just whitewash all these crimes? Oh, no, I don't think they would do that. Oh, really? I don't think you're very smart then. I think you're very foolish. Okay, verse 8. 
And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. Oh, look at you. What does it say? The two shall become one flesh, huh? And this guy's joined himself to all kind of abominable people that are illegal. Oh, but Solomon, he's so wise. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Let's go ahead and jump back into the other. I think I'm getting my point across, I hope. Unless I'm dealing with complete morons. So let's jump back in. We're talking about... Uh, So verse 20, then charged he to his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Yeah, what a heavy hit, you know, man, to... Start describing how brutal you'll be. You'll be murdered and sacrificed as the Lamb of God. So let's see what Peter says. Uh, that's what I was talking about. That Yeah, was he ready for those keys? Well, let's find out. Verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Ah, the heat. Man, he had some other ideas about reigning with Christ that probably he thought he'd be a big shot. You know, he was going to be like second to Caiaphas or something. Can you imagine? If they were going to rule the nation of Israel and expel the Romans, who knows what he was thinking? He must have been thinking some crazy stuff, though. That he definitely didn't know the power of the word. That he was erring big time. But... But when you err, what does that mean? Especially when you err in great matters. And I tried to show you a great matter about Solomon. Okay, let's see what, what the Lord Almighty, Jesus Christ, has to say. huh? Let's see what he says, though. Verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Yeah, that, that's very important That to savor us the things that be a God. You know, like if you love God, then you obey him. You know, and if you don't love God, then you don't obey him. You know, who is my brother? Who is my sister? Who is my mother? Those that know the will of God and act upon it. Remember? Yeah, that many will miss it. Man, many have missed it already. They don't know the sign of the times. They don't know what time they're even in. That they're all they're all mixed up. What's gonna happen though when God calls you out on it and calls these people out on it? Well look, he called Peter out on it, and what do you say? Get out of here, Satan. Get thee behind me. Okay. Yeah, that. What do you think when you start telling God? That, don't you think goats tell God? No, no, God, this is the way it's going to be with our traditions of men. You better think about it. You better think good and hard about it. You better meditate on it and not come up short. Verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself or herself and take up his cross and follow me. Think that's a good idea? I do. Man, what's on what 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 kind of cross do you have? Are you going to carry it? What happens if you don't? Boy, you're in trouble if you don't. Yeah, you might as well just go ahead and blot your name out of the book of life if you're not carrying your cross. That it's serious business. That God takes crosses seriously. Verse 25, how serious. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Yeah, that you're not going to be running your life. if you. It's God supposed to be running your life with what? His will. What he would will you to do. That you're a servant, and he is a master. That's why some of the disciples said a slave of Christ 
oh no not no it can't be like that no i'm supposed to be the big big shot and i'm supposed to declare to everyone this and that well that's a pretty big big pretty big challenge you've made for yourself i wouldn't do that verse 26 for what it is a man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul yeah that you're not your own no man dies unto himself no woman dies unto themselves and you're going to serve somebody so you know a lot of people don't understand that that they're in self will run riot and it's not going to be successful yeah that you could have yachts you could have big mansions you could have man trophy wife trophy husband and the list just goes on but what do you what, what if your name's not in the book of life boy you're in trouble i call that a self-will run riot kind of life okay verse 27 we're almost out of here for the son of man shall come in the glory of his father with the angels and then he shall reward every man according to his works what's this Oh, you mean we're going to go to sleep? Oh, the sleep of death, you mean? And then at the trumpet that we're going to we're going to rise from out of the graves. No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that at all, that that's false teachings. No, that you'll step out of your body when you die, your spirit, man, your spirit, woman, and you're going to be judged. There'll be an angel to take you to judgment. And what does it say? And then he shall he being Jesus, shall reward every man according to his works. Oh, according to his works. Do you have works in the flesh after you die? You think you're going to be taught some other time that God's going to come and teach you? Oh, yeah, he's going to come and teach you all right. He's going to teach you about judgment, like whether you get heaven or you get hell. When he rewards you according to your works, that's what he's going to teach that there's no kind of business about that there's some kind of teaching when you're lukewarm. I don't think so. That I've already said this. God will judge you with the law or he will judge you without the law. That he is God Almighty. That he can tell. Last verse. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the son of man coming in his kingdom. When does his kingdom come? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. When does his kingdom come? When he rose on the third day, the temple was risen. Yeah, he put to death that other stuff. Yeah, it's brand new, a new covenant. The kingdom of God. Yeah, there you go. That's what, yeah, you see it. The kingdom of God is within you. You know, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I think I'm hoping you're getting a picture. Uh, yeah, who didn't get to see it? Judas, that he probably was standing there listening. It looks like he murdered himself first. Yeah, I call suicide murder. That he decided to murder himself. <laughs> Maybe he had a little help. You know, who knows who helped do it, but looks like it. Might have been pretty tough for him to, to do that kind of cutting on himself. Anyway. Let's just pray out of here. That's about all I got to say. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we praise you, we love you, we honor you. Please help us to understand who we come into agreement, what kind of binding we would be binding on earth as it is in heaven. And, and teach us, Father, that, that we can't bind things on earth that are totally unacceptable to be Bound in heaven, teach us the workings of this binding and loosing so that we not be in error and go astray from thee. And we ask this in Jesus Christ of Nazareth's mighty name. Amen.